What does it mean to be called crazy in a crazy world? Listen to Madness Radio, Voices and Visions from Outside Mental Health. Sponsored by the Icarus Project and Portland Hearing Voices, Madness Radio can be heard on KBOOFM, the Pacifica Network, and online at madnessradio.net. Welcome to Madness Radio. This is your host, Will Hall. Uh, Today, my guest is Jim Van Oss. He's a professor of psychiatry at Maastricht University Hospital in the Netherlands. He has more than 700 publications, and he's one of the top 1% highly cited scientists in the world. He's trained in France, Indonesia, Morocco, and the UK, and is a member of the Royal Dutch Academy of Science. His Focus is on scientific knowledge combined with the experiential knowledge of people with lived experience of the mental health system. So welcome to Madness Radio, Jim Van Oss. Hi, Will. Hi. It, it's very great to have you here. Very impressive um, bio we just worked out for you. It's, it's extraordinary to meet someone um, who is really leading um, in psychiatry in, around the world and who also has such a, a transformative approach to mental health system and changing the system. So it's really great to have you on the show. Thanks. Thanks for the invitation. Great to be here. Yeah. And we, we met at the Crazy Wise conference and I, I was yes. so so impressed by by your work and your approach. It's the first time that I've ever been at a conference where there was a psychiatrist who was presenting on abolishing the mental health system. Yes. So I think I think these meetings are really important where people with lived experience and people working as professionals in the mental health system conducting science really meet each other and talk to each other. There's there's not much of that, uh, but fortunately more and more. And I think, you know, these kinds of meetings generate ideas and ways to bring about change, hardly need, uh, hardly needed change, I think, that can help uh, the mental health system improve. And you, you actually have, and you have a article in the British Medical Journal this month, we'll be linking to it from the website on schizophrenia does not exist. And we're going to be talking about that in just a moment. But I wanted to start by just asking you, you have such a different perspective than the mainstream of psychiatry and medical uh, science. How did you kind of come to this own, how, how did you kind of reach your own critical perspective? How is it that you were brought to have this different way of understanding psychiatry and mental health? So, well, there, there are several reasons. I think one of the reasons is that in, in Europe, of course, there, there, there are several voices within psychiatry that have been very critical and that have sought to bring about change from within. But uh, also for me, I think the most important change was to also actually witness uh, mental illness in my own family and actually what sort of struggle uh, people can have uh, going through the mental health system, uh, you know, hearing uh, the, the way the way the system communicates with them uh, and what sort of desperate uh, positions people finally find themselves in after trying to actually, you know, deal with something like psychosis. So this has been a very important critical influence as well, I think, and it has really made me look differently at my own profession. What was it that was happening with your own family that you saw? So, um, well, there are, uh, for example, I have a niece I've always been very close to, and she developed a psychotic illness. Uh, and, uh, you know, when she was maybe 23, 24. And what happened was that uh, for almost five to ten years, she was sort of trying to figure out what was happening to her beyond the messages she got from the mental health system, which was basically that she had a a range of different diagnostic uh, categories uh, offered to her, like schizophrenia, schizoaffective, bipolar, uh, making her and and the family very confused. And also uh, being told that there were guidelines for the treatments of these conditions that she had to follow. And these guidelines at the end of the day were basically that, uh, you know, she had to try different medications according to guidelines. But what was really uh, not happening was that the way she struggled with questions like what, what, what is happening to my life and how can I explain this to my environment? 
and you know what what does this mean for my future and is there any way i can uh you know i can i can start thinking about my previous goals again and and the way i wanted to go in life there was very little in terms of that kind of help with the most important question she was actually facing uh, and instead uh, she was invited to in, in in a world that consisted of you know diagnostic categories uh, language of brain disorders uh, language of uh, very little probability to actually do something again in terms of study and work uh, making her actually quite depressed this was a very impressive thing to witness. And then uh, it was also very interesting to see how the guidelines for the treatment of conditions like hers were actually devoid of language and strategies and ways of helping people to deal with these very existential questions that, of course, individuals face when they become in this kind of situation. So that, that was when uh, actually uh, it started to make uh, sense, unfortunately, belatedly for me, but, you know, the sort of message that the recovery movement has been trying to put to us uh, for almost 20 years and, and, and how really we were failing to actually take that seriously and include that into, into our work. So my niece actually uh, developed very much her own model. Uh, she did a lot of the work herself. And uh, finally, we, we, we sort of, as, as she grew more critical, I grew more critical as well, and we, and, and we found each other and made, uh, after, after maybe eight years uh, into her mental health career, we made a documentary together. And uh, the documentary really focused on, in, in the documentary, it, it was focused on her. And, and what she did, she went around uh, academics, uh, prestigious academics uh, working in the Netherlands in psychiatry. And she asked him about, you know, the sort of questions she had been uh, dealing with uh, when she was ill. Uh, and and she, she debated with them what, what, you know, from their perspective. And it was actually, you know, it was not like telling them that, that, that they were doing things wrong, but it was just to try to create a, a demonstration of what sort of questions we are very much not used to being put to us horizontally in interaction with the patient. So it was a very fascinating thing to see. And it was a very courageous thing of her to do as well, because, of course, you know, these were very prestigious academics and professors of psychiatry and neurology. Uh, and so the documentary was very popular. And what it also did, it, it, it really helped her f even further in her process of recovery. So you said that the way that your niece was talked to by the profession actually made her depressed and there was no real language or discussion that spoke to her own lived experience and gave her some answers and some guidance about how to move forward. And this really inspired you to get connected with the recovery movement to take a different view of psychiatry. Yes. And you have an article in the British Medical Journal that's just come out. It's called Schizophrenia Does Not Exist. Tell us about that. Yes, I, I was very glad actually the British Medical Journal showed interest in this article because it, it, it relates to a newspaper article we published uh, in, in, a, in a leading Dutch newspaper a year ago saying we should really abandon uh, terminology like schizophrenia. And, and there was a huge debate in the Netherlands and, and some of my academic colleagues branded me an anti-psychiatrist and, 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 and it was very <laughs> interesting. So the British Journal got hold of this and, and they wanted me to publish uh, something in, in the BMJ uh, on, on, their, on their personal uh, view section. So uh, that happened and this is now a year later and uh, very interestingly we saw that on Twitter and in the social media this really had an impact. Uh, mostly, uh, mostly I must say positive. Because the, what we were saying is not so much, you know, it, it's not saying psychiatry is bad and, and, you know, and that people should avoid it, but more saying uh, the science uh, underlying the use of this kind of terminology is very poor. And it also, it, it also doesn't match at all to uh, the experience uh, of people with psychosis. So there, was the, 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 there were two arguments. The first argument was that uh, words like, you know, schizophrenia that, that really 
are very uh, mystifying terminology to refer to something uh, you know like 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 the symptoms people can have doesn't help if 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 you're on the party and you tell people you've got depression the people know that depression is about emotions and that, that they have emotions so that they can still connect to you because they can link it to their own psychology uh, if you use words like schizophrenia which is basically a, a mystifying a greek term uh, then then people have very little possibility to make a connection to their own psychology so that they can understand where this person is coming from. So it, in, it, it immediately excludes uh, people. But it's not only exclusive, what also happens is that it very much makes people uh, powerless and isolated. Why is this? Well, this is because uh, schizophrenia is a construct that is now more or less equated with the notion of a severe brain disease for which you know scientifically there's there's not good evidence uh, and and which is very questionable in the first place to to talk in in terms of, of of brain disease but then this is very much become connected to poor outcome incurable devastating brain disease this is this is the language that is used in the most prestigious journals invariably when people describe schizophrenia so the effect is that if you're if you're invited to accept the label of schizophrenia you come in a position where automatically there's there's pressure on you to be excluded and to become isolated and also to become powerless because the brain disease is then there it's in your brain there's very little you can do yourself in terms of uh, improving your 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 future and your outcome so this kind of terminology is very dangerous but uh, but the most interesting point we try to uh, describe in the article is that all we ever really talk about is schizophrenia in terms of the prototypical psychotic illness. But the thing is, from epidemiology, we know that all the other categories of psychotic illness that are out there, like schizoaffective illness, schizophreniform disorder, delusional disorder, brief psychotic disorder, psychotic disorder not otherwise uh, classified, you know, psychotic disorder due to drugs, etc., etc. There's about 10 different diagnostic categories, labels that we use to classify psychotic illness. Th schizophrenia is only 30% of the total psychotic illness uh, prevalence that is there in the population. The other 70% is in the schizoaffective, schizophreniform and all the other labels. Uh, and now the interesting thing is that if you go to websites like those of the American Psychiatric Association, the only thing they mention there is schizophrenia and they call that a uh, severe chronic brain disorder something like that but they don't talk about the 70 percent other diagnostic categories of psychotic illness uh, that is the majority of psychotic illness but they don't describe schizoaffective disorder and they, they never mention like how they would see that is that also a brain disorder or, or not or and, and what about brief psychotic disorder so the thing is it's like uh, say, uh, take diabetes, for example. So diabetes, we know that 5% of people in the general population have diabetes. But imagine what would happen that we only focus on the 1% with diabetes that has the most severe outcome. And then we equate this picture of very severe outcome diabetes, where people have complications to their kidneys and their eyes and they get sores, that we equate this uh, very severe outcome diabetes with all diabetes in the population. So that if you go to your GP and, and, you know, uh, uh, and he diagnoses you with diabetes, he will say, oh my God, you have diabetes, you, know, you won't live uh, very long because it's a very terrible disease, etc. Uh, this, this, of course, doesn't happen. And uh, uh, another example is uh, autism spectrum. You know, autism... 20 years ago, it used to be a very rare, very severe disorder, we thought. Uh, but now, recently, this has all been abandoned, and now we talk about autism spectrum, which is a distributed trait in the general population that all people can have, you know, more or less of these autistic traits. And if you got, you know... Uh, high level autistic traits and you work in a certain situation or you work in a certain environment then that can give rise to problems uh, 
but but we don't consider the autism spectrum as a sort of disease in in the general population. We say it's a spectrum. Now it's exactly the same with psychosis. Psychosis exists as a spectrum, and we have all these different labels, but we can't see uh, uh, the wood anymore through the trees. So we we only focus on the tree schizophrenia and forget that there's a wood of psychosis spectrum. And I want to ask you about your research on the what's called psychosis and the spectrum and how it exists in among people who are not diagnosed and have not been in uh, in the mental health system. But um, but I want to sort of go back to the article in the BMG and just ask you why do, why is it that you think that schizophrenia has been treated this way by the medical establishment that it hasn't been given this kind of consideration and um, seen in a more sophisticated or complicated or subtle way and it's just been kind of thrown all together as this chronic overwhelming disease in the way that you talk about in the article. Why is it that the profession has, has done this? Well, I think there's several reasons. The first reason is that this whole notion of, of the classification system uh, that is used in psychiatry it was born in the, in the asylums of the early 20th century where uh, only people with severe impairments were hospitalized. And that, that's where the idea about our uh, diseases, if you like, started. So there's always been this notion of, of, of uh, what Kraepelin called dementia precox, sort of early onset dementia uh, associated with schizophrenia. Uh, the second reason, I think, is that uh, it is very important for researchers, and those and the researchers are the ones that take up most space in the in the most prestigious scientific journals, which the press then takes their ideas from as well. And the researchers need to stress the importance of the things they research and because they need more money. So invariably they will say schizophrenia is this terrible brain disease. And if only we could make more you know, neuroimaging uh, research projects and, and, and study the thing more closely, then we'll find a medical solution because they believe that uh, the mental illness construct of mental illness in psychiatry is something that that is associated with symptoms, and then the symptoms are, if you believe in in a sort of a medical approach, symptoms are treated by doctors with medications, and then if the symptoms disappear, the doctor has done a good job. And if our treatments don't work, it just means that we need more money uh, to do more neurobiological research to find better treatments. That is the rationale of the neurobiological research underlying this, this, this notion of schizophrenia being a very severe brain disorder. And you mentioned that both South Korea and Japan have already abandoned the term schizophrenia. Have they done it for the reasons that you outline in your article? Yes, so very interesting. Well, they haven't done it for any scientific reason. So the fact that psychosis is a broad spectrum and that that scientifically has been shown and that it doesn't make sense to phone, to focus only on the 30% with the most severe outcome, that, that wasn't the, the argument. The argument was that in terms of uh, shame and stigma and using labels to describe other people, that is something that the Asian peoples are much more sensitive to. So uh, calling uh, somebody a name or giving somebody a label that then is associated in society with very severe stigma and that uh, the, the language of the label itself is, is contributing to that stigma even more so that it becomes a, what we call a iatrogenic stigma, a stigma caused by uh, the medical profession. So that, that is something they are much more sensitive to. So uh, relatives associations, for example, were very keen for this name to change because, for example, in Japanese, the, the term schizophrenia was literally translated, uh, sounded like mind-splitting disease. Now, uh, that that's not a very nice thing to call another person. So in Japan, what happened if that patients were admitted for a very long time, they, they basically... First episode psychosis, somebody disappeared for a year or two years in a mental hospital uh, because of the shame associated with the label. And then if they came back, uh, they were they were actually shunned. So uh, the label became very much an invitation to commit suicide because that's the sort of culturally uh, sanctioned uh, response to collective shame. Uh, so then the, the suicide rate it was very high. We also see that in the West. We also see people 
you know, receiving the label and then looking on the internet, seeing it's a terrible brain disease, and that will sometimes will actually increase or cause uh, suicidal ideation. So that's why the, the the relatives and then and then other organizations asked the psychiatric association to change, and they changed the name. The nice thing is that in the Japanese characters they used to describe this label, there there is a notion of uh, vulnerability and plasticity, so that vulnerability you can you can change so that 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 is a lot better and then in south korea they did something similar and in hong kong uh it's it's not official but they also now use different terminology to describe uh this this label of schizophrenia so you mentioned in your british medical journal article that given that psychosis is a broad spectrum it doesn't make sense to describe it in terms of a brain disorder and a brain disease and a neurological um, disorder. And I'm interested in something that we often hear in the United States, which is that, look, not only is it a brain disease and a neurological disorder, but the antipsychotic medications serve a neuroprotective function. In other words, if you don't take these drugs, um, not only are your, are your symptoms not going to be treated, but your brain is actually going to deteriorate more because the drugs play a protective role against this disease. Tell us a little bit about that yeah, I, I think I think you know we don't help ourselves as a profession to uh, actually share these kinds of statements with, with with the world because they're unscientific, and I, I don't think it is wise to you know see psychiatry uh, as as a sort of PR public relations exercise selling ideas about why it is we think we're doing good things. Uh, so, for example, the notion of something like uh, psychotic phenomena and symptoms as, as a brain disorder uh, can be a hypothesis. I mean, it's, 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 it's good to perhaps, you know, posit that as a hypothesis, but there's multiple problems with it. Uh, first, the thing is, uh, we know, of course, there is a, 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 a relationship between mental experience and brain activity in the sense that if there's no brain, it is unlikely that there will be mental activity. So they're uh, dependent on each other. The brain uh, probably mediates mental activity. But that's quite different from saying that all mental experience is caused by brain activity. That's a whole different statement. And that is taking things way further uh, than actually science would allow you. Because simply we don't know uh, how this mediating mechanism of brain activity and mental experience is, 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 is regulated. And philosophers actually are way ahead of the psychiatrists. Psychiatrists have this model of saying the brain causes the mind, which is, uh, you know, at best a hypothesis, but it is an unlikely hypothesis because mind also causes brain. Uh, you know, mind activity has an impact on the way uh, the brain uh, is, is, is shaped and mental experience drives brain development. So they have a two-way relationship and there's many other models of brain mind that have been developed in, in philosophy that can be applied to psychiatry. So what we, what we should tell the public, I think, is, uh, I think is for example, cannabis can cause somebody to feel extremely happy. But that doesn't mean that cannabis is a drug for the disease on happiness. It just means it just means that molecules that are out there that you can take and digest have an impact on your mental experience because through the brain. I mean that's fine. So maybe uh, you know if you have uh, if you have a severe acute psychosis and you take uh, a drug like an antipsychotic that causes you to, to, to become indifferent to your mental experience that maybe you will experience your psychosis in such a way that it becomes more bearable temporarily. I mean, that, that's fine to describe that to people, but to say it sort of uh, changes the causal mechanisms, brain mechanisms underlying psychosis so that basically it cures uh, the psychosis in the brain and furthermore it protects uh, you uh, it protects you from further the, the, the brain further uh, becoming unwell and you 
uh, receiving again uh, and you relapsing into another psychosis that is not that is not that is not true so it's simply antipsychotics are symptomatic treatments they do something with the symptoms but they do it in widely different ways in different people and this whole notion of of you continuing to take antipsychotic medication uh, what we should tell uh, patients is look we don't know what the effects are if you take this medication for five years we simply don't know what the effects are it could well be that uh, the, the the medication then will impact on your brain because your brain will try to compensate for the effects of the medication uh, and it may well be that in some people this process of compensation for the effects of the medication is such that it will actually make you more liable to uh, develop further psychotic episodes rather than protect you against further psychotic episodes. And uh, we should tell people this is a scientific hypothesis that we need to urgently research further because we don't want to make people more liable to, so, to suffer psychotic breaks. We, we, you know, we want people to protect. And, all, and, and of course, the, 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 the other side, side of the coin is that if you tell people there's medications to cure your brain disease, then again, this whole notion uh, is, is actually there's, there's an embedded powerlessness in this message because you, you suggest there's nothing you can do yourself. And there's much, uh, I think, experiential evidence out there, but also scientific uh, group-based evidence suggesting that indeed there's many things people can do to actually get to know their psychosis and 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 what it is about and how they how they can relate uh, to to psychotic symptoms in a way that it becomes you know uh, embedded in your life and that it that it actually makes sense. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk about the psychotic symptoms. Um, because you, in, in discussing the idea of a, a psychosis as a broad spectrum, you've done some research uh, which um, shows really clearly that what we call psychosis, actually people in the so-called normal population who don't have difficulty with the experience, who don't end up in hospitals, who don't end up with a diagnosis, have these same experiences. And this is something that's been discussed um, very much um, in the hearing voices movement, that voice hearing, you know, from a certain perspective, it's a, it's a sign that it's an auditory hallucination. You hear voices, it's a hallucination. Therefore, your brain is malfunctioning. You have uh, schizophrenia, you have this brain disease. And this hearing voices movement has really... Um, shown that that's not true, that there's a prevalence of voice hearing in the population of people who don't have those problems. It's distributed in the normal population. And some people do have difficulty and do have distress. And then you've taken a broader perspective in the research, and you've shown that that all different kinds of psychotic symptoms also have this distribution in the normal population. Tell us about that and the implications that that has in terms of our understanding of what it is that we're talking about when we talk about psychosis or madness or mental illness. Yeah, thanks. So uh, uh, so there have been, at, at some stage, epidemiology made its, uh, was introduced in psychiatry. And I think this was a very important uh, topic because psychiatry used to have as its field of clinical practice and research, basically the mental hospitals and, and, and where people uh, were actually treated who, who, who had uh, severe impairments. And nobody actually uh, looked at the general population to see what, what, what was out there in terms of the, the, the experiences that could resemble uh, the, the ones that it, in, 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 in the mental health system. So epidemiology then uh, made uh, its way to the general population. So people started to ask questions in the general population about the uh, symptoms that were traditionally associated with mental disorders like depression and anxiety and autism, but also uh, psychosis. And very interestingly, uh, from these general population studies, uh, there came there came signals that, that that there were very high rates of experiences that were traditionally assumed to be the symptoms of mental illness, even uh, severe brain disorders like uh, schizophrenia. At least that's that's how they were framed. And 
uh, this gave rise to a lot of confusion. So initially, for example, very interesting article was in the United States, uh, one of the epidemiological services in the United States. And, and actually, they showed that, that about maybe uh, 20 to 30 percent of the American U.S. population had at least once in their lifetime had experiences that uh, actually uh, resembled uh, auditory hallucinations and paranoid delusions and feeling influenced by strange powers, uh, literally answering the questions put to them by interviewers, do you ever hear voices or do you feel you're, you're, you're being persecuted by, 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 by organizations, etc.? And that clearly that we're, we're, we're delusional. And then the interviewers uh, said, well, okay, we're going to uh, re-interview these individuals and we're going to invite the psychiatrist to re-interview these individuals. And then the psychiatrist came to a very different conclusion. They said that the prevalence of psychosis was not 20 to 30 percent, but was 0.7 percent. And they said, yes, because this is what they said, well, we define psychosis not only... Uh, as people having psychotic experiences, but also you need to be uh, taking antipsychotics and be admitted to a mental hospital. And uh, you know, if you talk, then other people can't make sense of what you're saying. So uh, uh, in that fashion, they said, okay, it's only 0.7% and the rest are false positives. But of course, an epidemiologist looking at these data uh, will come to a quite different conclusion because it's quite well known that almost every possible human uh, clinical phenotype or disease or disorder from hypertension to diabetes to depression, autism, but also psychosis exists as a spectrum, as a continuum from something that varies from uh, with a, a little bit to something that you can have expression of in a severe degree. And why should it be different from psychosis? That's very implausible. So now we know that this has been replicated many, many times in many populations. Populations have high rates of experiences that uh, uh, are uh, that resemble the, 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 the symptoms of patients with uh, psychotic disorders, so auditory hallucinations, paranoid delusions. Uh, but the thing is, they are experiences that uh, people have in daily life. And sometimes they can be quite supportive. So then you, you stumble across individuals that will tell you, well, I, yes, I do hear voices, but they give me advice, for example, on what I should do in certain difficult situations. Yes, and I know this from my own personal experience because I was, I was struggling living in a, my apartment in San Francisco years ago, and uh, I was hiding hiding, and wasn't going out and having a lot of, 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 of just incredible um, suffering and very isolated from other people. And I, I knew that there was this thing called yoga and I wanted to kind of learn about it and check it out. And I had got some books, but I was never able to really do it. I was never able to really get myself to make that step to just a, something as simple as going to a, to a class. And I remember I was on the floor of my, of my bathroom and I was crying. I was very, very upset alone in my apartment. And I heard this really loud voice and the voice said, you are going to die if you don't do yoga. Mm. And so this was this was how I started to do yoga. That's what motivated me to start practicing yoga. And so yeah. my experience was that these things that are called auditory hallucinations or psychotic symptoms from a medical perspective actually for, was a very positive thing for me ultimately because I did go on and do yoga that did get me to my first yoga class and I was able to get a discount and some support from the teacher and that really made a big difference in my own in my mm. own recovery so mm. so a yeah. lot of us a lot of us definitely have these experiences of mm. not non-ordinary or different reality um, things happening to us that are positive and helpful or we have a more complicated relationship with it than it just being this yes. ne negative disease part because you could say that hearing an angry threatening voice telling me I'm mm -hmm. going to die is a negative experience it certainly was but it's also a positive experience because it's trying to really motivate me and get me yes. get me moving so yes yeah so there there from what you're telling of course you you can immediately deduce that there's a a potential for a, a sort of a catastrophic misunderstanding 
uh, if you if you meet a mental health professional, the the thing is that that humans have all kinds of experiences, and what we tend to do with those experiences, we tend to attach meaning to those experiences, and we we tend to relate them to our life history. So the the potential for confusion is then if a mental health professional will very much have a, a tendency to see these experiences sometimes as symptoms of an underlying brain disease. So between the perspective from uh, of, of meaning and the perspective of symptom of brain disease, there is a tremendous uh, uh, potential amount of confusion. And I think that's, that, that, that kind of confusion should be taken into account more uh, when, uh, when, when psychiatrists undergo training to become a mental health professional. Mm -hmm. So if we see that these experiences, these psychotic experiences, actually do have a prevalence in the normal population, how do we then rethink our approach? Because one of the things that the Hearing Voices movement has been doing is saying, look, let's actually research the experiences themselves and let's research what's the difference between someone who, say, hears voices and just considers it a normal part of their life and someone who hears voices and it, it drives them to be isolated ending up in the mental health system. What is it that is different between those two kinds of experiences? And then you get into more detail of learning what the meaning is for one person's individual life rather than making the assumption that the presence of the symptom means that it, it's a disease is there. So what, what are some of the implications of that epidemiological finding that you're talking about? So I, I think very interestingly, the implication is really that uh, psychosis uh, and experiences uh, that, 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 that we tend to see as psychotic are, is, is something that really evolves within an individual and can be seen as a, a psychological process. Uh, so, very interestingly, from the epidemiology, actually, you go on to psychology. Uh, so, Sandra Escher and Marius Romme, whom I worked with, Sandra was a, a PhD student of mine, she actually followed children who actually re reported hearing voices. And she showed that of, of a sample of, of maybe 100 children that, that she followed over, over time, about 80 percent, uh, 60 to 80 percent, over the course of time actually stopped reporting hearing voices. And uh, uh, very interestingly then, then, these were children that tended to say uh, at the beginning of the interview that, that they had good relationships uh, with these voices in the sense that the voices were not overly negative or were not uh, you know, associated with anxiety or that they made uh, the, that the voices made the children feel very powerless. or uh, and, and these kinds of dynamic relationships the children had with their voices, to the degree that we really could establish that, of course, with, with young children. But the data suggested very strongly that the, the relationship with the voice mattered very much uh, to what happened over time. So the children who, who persisted uh, with the voices uh, sometimes also had outcomes uh, like needing to contact uh, a mental health professional and that they came into contact with the mental health system. Uh, and these, these were very often children that had uh, negative relationships with the voices or the voices resembled the voices of, of persons they had negative relationships with or people that, uh, the, that, that voices that were attributed to people that had been tormenting them or abusing them or uh, had been bullying them as a child. So this, this, this very much suggests that there's a psychological process uh, that can become embedded in the quality of the relationship between the person and the voice that matters to the eventual outcome in the sense whether you learn to live with the voice or, or the voice doesn't become important anymore and you, and you lose the experience or whether uh, there is uh, uh, an, an outcome of uh, escalation and that people eventually uh, start uh, to seek help uh, with in, 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 in the mental health system. So I want to talk um, about another aspect of your work, um, which is a very interesting and very important um, for us to understand, which is that you've looked at this idea of evidence-based medicine. And in the United States, and I know around the world, 
the idea is that, well, you know, we don't want to fund just any kind of therapy. We don't want to fund any kind of treatment. We want to have evidence. We want to have evidence that says this works. And we want to be able to show it in a clinical way with research, and it's very specifically defined, so that we know that we're getting results, so we have this evidence-based medicine. What are your thoughts about that in the context of psychosis and mental health and discussion that we're having about um, the understandings of, of schizophrenia and, and diagnosis? Yeah, so I think something very interesting is happening, and that is that uh, uh, also, like in journals like the British Medical Journal, there's now articles appearing that saying that the uh, the whole movement of evidence-based medicine is in crisis. And that's for several reasons. The first reason is that, uh, you know, on the basis of these group-based randomized controlled trials, where you compare two groups and two treatments, and you get a mean difference, for example, in the effects of the treatments. Uh, so this kind of evidence is then translated to clinical guidelines that clinicians have to follow when they treat patients. Uh, but this has led to guidelines that you know are hundreds and hundreds of pages of basically summing up trials and meta-analyses and evidence that are simply not manageable anymore. So if you're, uh, you know, uh, for example, in, in the mental health system, uh, if you have a, a diagnosis of depression, you usually also have a diagnosis of anxiety disorder or personality disorder or, or whatever, because the way the DSM is shaped is that you usually have two or three or maybe four different diagnoses. So which guideline are you going to follow? Anxiety or depression or, and it becomes very difficult. So there's simply, there's too much. But another important problem is that more and more we see that in psychiatry, uh, like, for example, something like the diagnosis of depression, we know that uh, all treatments tend to work in the same weak fashion. So whether it's psychotherapy or an antidepressant, all treatments at the group level of the randomized controlled trials show the same weak effect size. So this is called the dodo effect. Dodo effect means... All treatments must win, you know, from uh, uh, Alice, Lewis in Wonderland. And, uh, Alice in Wonderland. Uh -huh. But what evidence-based medicine can't tell you is that beneath the weak uh, group effects, uh, differences, there are huge, there's huge heterogeneity, there's huge variability in who will respond to psychotherapy or who will respond to, for example, an antidepressant. So the fact is that some people will actually get worse from an antidepressant. Some people may get better from an, from an antidepressant. Some people may get worse uh, with psychotherapy. And some people may get much better with psychotherapy. So the whole problem is you can have weak group effects from a randomized controlled trial, but it doesn't tell you who will actually respond to what. Uh, that's a much more urgent question. And then the third issue is that we see more and more that... All this evidence of randomized controlled trials in the mental health uh, system uh, misses out on very important moderators. So now there's more and more evidence showing that uh, actually it may not be the psychotherapy itself that helps you or the antidepressant itself that helps you be, uh, get better. It may be mediated by a very important degree, uh, but the type of therapeutic relationship you have with the person who is sitting there uh, and trying to, you know, sort out problems with you. And there's strong evidence suggesting that if there's a person opposite you who's authentic, who is, you know, real, who is em em uh, em empathic and is really interested in you, then that really helps you, uh, actually, that helps you make yourself get better. So the, we are rethinking this whole notion that, uh, getting well or getting better in from a mental health problem is something that a professional does to the patient. We are seriously rethinking the whole model and that the professional really, what he should be doing is helping the patient help him or herself. And that uh, there's a lot of resources uh, that, that people have that can actually be kindled by the type of therapeutic relationship you have. So this is an entirely different model. And then, of course, it, it goes immediately on. Then who are the best people to do this? And yes, uh, there's now evidence that things like, you know, peer support and people with lived experience helping other people who are 
in a different stage of their recovery process, that that may be actually one of the most important ingredients, particularly in psychosis, that uh, the mental health system is not offering enough. Uh, certainly not enough in my country, but uh, you know, uh, in, in, in I think almost every other country in the world. Mm -hmm. And is this related to the idea of the placebo effect confounding these group-based, evidence-based um, models that that um, the variability of individual response is so different and the actual, the intervention, even if it's a medical intervention like a pill or even a surgery or something, there's going to be so much variation and so much of that variation of how an individual is going to respond, not a group aggregate in a study, but an individual is based on the relationship, the expectation, the placebo, all the different things that come into the, the mental and the relational and the social aspects of what's going on. So I think this is fascinating research as well, because as a scientist, you know, I, I've always wondered why, why do we see the placebo effect as, as a nuisance effect in randomized controlled trials? It doesn't make sense. Uh, because in, in, in psychiatry and, and psychology, the placebo effects are sizable in the order of 30 to 40 percent if you, if you define your outcome as dichotomous, as something that you have uh, yes or no. So 30 to 35 uh, percent uh, placebo response compared to uh, maybe 40 to 50 percent uh, active treatment response. You know that that that, that, that the very small differences. So the placebo effect is actually Ted Kapchuk from Harvard University has been investigating this placebo effect, and he showed that if you give a placebo uh, in the context of a of a warm relationship then the placebo works much better than if you give the placebo in the context of a cold interpersonal professional relationship. So uh, this shows you that the placebo effect is, you know, it is not just uh, expectations. It is undergoing a ritual uh, of healing that if it's really... Uh, taken into account that the context then becomes very different, like a warm relationship and being, you know, authentic and, and, and empathic and, and interested, then this whole healing process will work much better. And the placebo effect really shows that we as human beings, we are able to derive a lot of, a lot of healing power, apparently, from undergoing this ritual of treatment, even in the mental health system. Because the mental health system, of course, is not usually a very warm system. Uh, so even in the current mental health system, people are able to pick up a lot of uh, healing, apparently. Uh, and that is, I think, because a lot of mental health professionals, in fact, are very motivated uh, in, in, in doing their job and helping people. It's just that they, they have, very often, they have learned uh, things uh, during their professional training that, that actually make it more difficult for them to have these relationships, these therapeutic relationships, rather than make it easier for them. Jim, a few months ago, we were at the Crazy Wise uh, conference in the Netherlands, and I, I was really very, very moved um, by your work and your research around the idea, essentially, of abolishing the mental health system as we know it today and creating a completely different way of working with people. And you presented an idea that has a different understanding of what health is, a different understanding of what disease is or how we think of these things as diseases and a different understanding of how to help people around their health. And then very specific concrete model about what we might replace the mental health system with. So tell us about that vision for change and then how we, how we would get there. Yeah, so f fortunately, you know, for us in the Netherlands, there's a lot of momentum, and that's caused by several things. The first thing is that there's a lot of interest in, in Europe and the world in redefining health. Uh, so that the old definition of health really was based on, uh, you know, absence of disease, absence of symptoms, and complete well-being. Now, that's a very high threshold. So... Uh, you know, in the in the era of infectious diseases being the main uh, causal factor uh, in 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 morbidity, of course, this makes sense. Uh, you're you're cured from your tuberculosis, or you're not. But these days, you know, health is much more, and 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 treatment is much more about helping people with 
more or less chronic problems like diabetes and rheumatoid arthritis and depression, etc. So the definition of health, if you say it's about absence of symptoms, you know, you're inviting actually the medical system to completely over treat individuals in an effort to eradicate symptoms. So uh, the, the conditions we now have don't ask for eradication of symptoms. It asks for a new definition of health. And this was given, uh, it was published some time ago, I think in, in the Lancet or the British Medical Journal, stating that health really is the capacity to adapt and self-manage and you know take your own control given uh, chronic challenges, psychological, uh, physical, and social. We could even call that empowerment. Exactly, we could call it empowerment. And very importantly, in that definition is also embedded the sense of health not being just about symptoms, but being of a higher order dimension, namely the way you have meaning in life and the way you have fulfillment in life uh, by trying to reach uh, meaningful goals. Uh, so this is very interesting, and this is now going very rapidly, at least in, in Europe. Uh, so it had a huge impact on the, on, the, on the mental health system, at least in the Netherlands, because we realized you know, we spent an enormous amount of money in the Netherlands, proportionally on mental health, more than possibly any other country except Germany. And uh, we realized that what we were doing, that we provide massively uh, treatments that are aimed at reducing symptoms, based on making a diagnosis, because you need the diagnosis in order to get into the mental health system in the Netherlands, and then the reimbursement clock starts ticking. And after these diagnoses, there are guidelines of escalating treatments. They're really medical escalating treatment guidelines that invite people to become a passive patient whilst the doctor makes you better. So we realized that, you know, this was not very, very functional. And then uh, actually the mental health system in the Netherlands invited, you know, consultants, uh, economic consultants like like the ones you have from Anderson, uh, you know, the, these consultancy uh, 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 bureaus to look at them. And then they came to the conclusion that the system was completely inefficient and not cost effective because what they did is they there was massive overtreatment of relatively mild mental problems and there was rel- and there was massive undertreatment of those who need who were most in need of, of 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 the help of professionals so what we then did is we wrote a book uh, together with people with lived experience here in the Netherlands with Wilma Boevink together with my colleague Philippe de Les Paul who's a psychologist uh, and people who are experts in e-health and m-health, and we wrote a book saying that if we, you know, given all this money we spent on mental health, if you, if you were really to rethink the system, what would it look like? So, very interestingly, what we came up with is that uh, you need a mental health system that is much smaller in scale. You have now huge mental health organizations where, where sometimes thousands of people work that don't know each other, that are totally bureaucratic, work only on the basis of, of diagnoses and escalating guideline treatments. So we say we should do away with all this and redistribute the money to create small scale communities in neighborhoods where actually you, uh, you help people. But in a completely different fashion, what you do is you uh, maybe half of the staff of the 100 FTE full-time equivalents you will have for an area of 20,000, maybe half of these individuals will be people with lived experience that know how, that know how to build resilience uh, in, in people and how to help people formulate meaningful goals again in life that, in, in short, that can work on, on recovery. The other half will be perhaps uh, mental health professionals that, that can also do their thing but uh, not on the basis of diagnosis, but on the basis of helping people with getting back uh, their lives. You know, you can do some symptom reduction if that's necessary. That's fine. But that's just a means to the higher order goal, and that is getting your life back. So we want to treat very much uh, using, so if there's hundreds of these multi experience team in, in, in the neighborhood, we want to work using the open dialogue methods of activating networks around people. Uh, rather than, than singling out people and, and calling them patients. So you activate the networks, you reduce the shame and the stigma automatically. You treat 
by uh, enhancing resilience rather than just reducing symptoms. Uh, and very importantly, uh, there, there's very close collaboration with general practitioners for in, in terms of general health issues. And finally, uh, and this is uh, what we're trying to realize uh, as well, uh, very excitingly, I think, is that you also try to create a local economy, uh, uh, a social economy in the neighborhood uh, by bringing monies that are normally in, in, in another area, but where it can't be short-circuited with mental health care, that you short-circuit those, those funds so that in a budget-neutral budget operation you can create a social economy based on providing care for each other so that uh, people with lived experience can help others and be paid for it. Uh, and actually, I think this, this, is, this is something that is uh, where, where the U.S. actually is much better at than, than Europe. So Europe... Actually, because of the welfare system, people uh, paradoxically are sort of made uh, or, 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 or are sort of put in a position of lifelong dependence and a total disincentive to ever go out there again and, and seek, you know, continuing with your education and, and, and trying to seek a job. And that, I think, is in the U.S. that works much better. So uh, social economies and, and local economies and 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 and. and, and uh, the, these kinds of things to help people, uh, you know, do 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 get, 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 do meaningful uh, jobs again are, are are much difficult, more difficult to create in 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 countries like in Western Europe. So this this we we now have six big mental health organizations that actually uh, have joined us and are actually willing to close beds and uh, distribute redistribute their staff and retrain their staff to working with people with lived experience in the neighborhood uh, according to these different methods. And we're going to start four pilots in the Netherlands, one in Amsterdam and three others in, in less well-known cities in the Netherlands, one here in Maastricht. Uh, and from these pilots, we hope to learn. So we, we don't want to change the whole system at once because that's a bad idea. You need to learn from uh, pilots. And because we got a lot of grassroots support from people with lived experience in the Netherlands, actually mental health institutions are actually moving along with us. And, and big insurers are also moving along with us because they hope uh, that, that we'll create new models that will actually help people rather than make them uh, dependent in, the very, in, in various ways. And one of the things that we see is the harm that comes from using so much uh, medications, antipsychotics and other medications, how will this different model change that aspect of the mental health system? Yeah, so, uh, you know, what we think is very important is that, that people should be able to decide uh, about, you know, what sort of molecules they want to use in, uh, in, 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 in helping them. Uh, but, but so what we think is very important is that uh, they get the right information. So they, they should know that, uh, you know, what these medications are, uh, that uh, they're not, they don't cure a brain disease, but they are psychotropic molecules that, that, that cause, uh, that, can, that, that impact on your experience in a variety of ways, and that you can use them sometimes to suppress symptoms if you really need that. But then uh, the, the higher order goal is to actually uh, try to wean yourself off these medications and to try to find out whether you can do without them. And uh, people should be, uh, actually as a matter of routine, I think, should be helped with these experiments if they want, of course. If they say, well, no, I want to take this medication for the rest of my life, then uh, they should do that. But virtually all people I know who've come into contact with antipsychotics at some stage say, I want to experiment and see what happens if I reduce them. And then what happens is that clinicians often have got very little experience in how to do that, particularly with antidepressants. Antidepressants are very difficult to stop because you get all sorts of withdrawal symptoms. And the doses, the doses you need to withdraw the symptoms uh, cannot be, are not produced by the, the pharmaceutical companies. So the they size give you of the, the dosage the size, of the pills, yeah. Yeah, yeah because we know that particularly to, to wean yourself of the last bit of paroxetine, you need very, very small doses that are not commercially available. That's um, paroxetine but, is Paxil, I think, in the U.S. Yes. So we, we have a user research center here, so where people with lived experience to do PhD projects. And one of our 
uh, users actually, our PhD students, actually devised uh, tapering strips for antidepressants. So he worked with a non-profit pharmaceutical company to make tapering strip. It's a strip where you can tell people, oh, this is a strip, you can stop your paroxetin in 30 days, and this is a strip, you can stop your paroxetine in 50 days. And it's automatically, it's just day by day, and exactly the right dose to taper it off in, in, you know, in, in, at the rate you want, at the speed you want, is there. What an, extraordinary, so, what an extraordinary image of collaboration between patients and um, the medical system to have people with, user, pe- people with lived experience working with pharmaceutical companies to come up with a product that helps people to come off of medications in a safe way. What an incredible image that is of what the future could be for the mental health system. Yes, so he's been very, very successful. His name is Peter uh, Groot, and he actually wanted to do this because it was, you know, the big question he was faced with. He was taking antidepressants, uh, but he he wasn't sure whether he really needed them. So he tried to uh, reduce the dose, but then he had these terrible withdrawal symptoms. So this this question actually drove him to develop this tapering strip because he knew from other people he met, that this was uh, a big problem. And it is a big problem because in the Netherlands, we have 1.2 million people out of a total population of 17 million. We have 1.2 taking antidepressants. And the epidemiological evidence suggests that they do not continue these medications because they need them, but because they don't know how to stop them. And uh, this, this, this gives a whole new dimension to psychopharmacology, of course, because it is easy to put somebody on medication. Uh, but then after six weeks, we don't have any more information from, from trials about what happens. And we have even less information about how it impacts on the brain. And there's now emerging evidence that uh, I will soon publish an article on together with uh, Robin Murray from the Institute of Psychiatry in in London, is emerging evidence that actually this notion of a dopamine supersensitivity syndrome, meaning your brain becomes hypersensitive because the antipsychotics have been blocking the receptors for so long, uh, that this actually may exist in some people. And that maybe we can try to diagnose this more and be more careful uh, in prescribing antipsychotics. And uh, And there's also evidence that it that happens with antidepressants as well, that there's a certain kind of sensitivity that develops. Yeah. And of course, this makes sense because the brain will try to adapt itself to all kinds of external influences that that is it, it is faced with. So it makes sense. Yeah. So we need much more information on this. Jim, are you hopeful that these kinds of collaborations from people with lived experience in the system and with the forward-thinking psychiatrists and even people in the pharmaceutical industry can work together and create this new mental health system? Are you hopeful that this is actually the, the direction that we can go on in the future? I am very hopeful, yes. I think in, in 20 years' time, we will look back on you know, psychiatry as it was practiced, say, between 1970 and 2010 in a, in a completely different vein. And I think we will have new models of framing mental problems and certainly how to help people with mental problems. Yes, I think it's going to be uh, a different world. Jim, we're just about out of time with the interview. Give us um, contact information if people want to get in touch with you to find out more about your research and, and, and work and find out more about um, who you are and what you do. Give us some contact information about that. So the, the, the best way to contact me actually is through my email. Uh, the email is very easy. It's, it's vanosj, one word, v-a-n-o-s-j at gmail.com. Jim Van Os, thank you so much for joining us today on Madness Radio. Thank you so much for having me, Will. Thank you. You've been listening to an interview with Jim Van Os. He's a professor of psychiatry at Maastricht University Hospital in the Netherlands. He has more than 700 publications, is one of the top 1% highly cited scientists in the world, and a member of the Royal Dutch Academy of Science. He's trained in France, Indonesia, Morocco, and the UK. And his focus is on bringing together scientific knowledge with experiential knowledge 
from people with lived experience of being in the mental health system. That's all the time we have on Madness Radio. Thanks for tuning in. You've been listening to Madness Radio, voices and visions from outside mental health. Madness Radio is sponsored by the Icarus Project and Portland Hearing Voices. Host is Will Hall and producer is Nina Packabush. Madness Radio can be heard on KBOOFM and the Pacifica Network and shows are archived online at madnessradio.net.